Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that in, indeed in Christ we have been granted by your mercy and your grace to have the joy that is beyond description, a joy that supersedes any and everything that we face, including life's hardships, trials, and difficulties. <clears throat> so tonight we pray you will help us think about that. In a world that is joyless, we pray that you will cultivate your joy in us tonight. In Christ's name, amen. If you brought your copy of the Bible, I invite you to open the scripture to Philippians chapter 4. And uh, this is the introduction of a series of talks I intend to give out of <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4. Uh, this chapter has been on my heart for some time. Someone recently challenged me to think about that, uh, what Paul was saying here and how that applies to our lives. And as I did so, I found it was speaking to me. So I'd like to share uh, my thoughts with you out of Philippians chapter, <clears throat> chapter 4. You know this as one of Paul's prison epistles, meaning he wrote this <clears throat> while he was in prison. Keeping that in mind, it's rather remarkable that he said what he said and what he experienced in prison as a believer, as a follower of Christ. <clears throat> Tonight, I want to look at one verse. I bet you know what verse that is. <clears throat> it is verse 4. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. I have one word that serves as my title tonight, <clears throat> and it is the word rejoice. And it is a word that you will find <clears throat> used twice in one verse. I'm reading the ESV. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words, two of which are rejoice. <clears throat> so I think it's very significant. So tonight, I want to talk to you about rejoice. Philippians 4.4 4 reads thusly in the ESV. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, first, let me talk about the text itself, <clears throat> because I think that's very not only interesting, but it's important. And then I want to raise four questions that we'll try to answer about the text. First, the text itself. <clears throat> uh, this, this sentence uh, centers around a main verb, which is translated rejoice. It comes from the common Greek word for joy. It is the verb form of that word. In fact, the verb is used twice, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice <clears throat> as a verb. It is a word that contains action. This is something we're to do. Now, I think that's kind of a striking feature to me. Because if you're like me, I'm sure you're a much better Christian than I am. But when I think of joy, I don't think of that as something I do. I think that uh, that is something that happens to me, perhaps arbitrarily, because things are going well in my life, right? Everything's going great. I have joy. In fact, I, I rejoice in action when I have joy in my heart. And if I don't have joy in my heart, I don't rejoice. Does that make sense? Or am I the only sinner here at having trouble with this? <clears throat> so the other thing is, <clears throat> when I think of joy, the noun version of this word, <clears throat> I think of it more as, as um, a feeling, right? I feel happy. I feel excited. I, I feel enthused. And somehow that 
that feeling forms what I define as joy. But something here tells me my understanding of this is off kilter. Right? First of all, it's not a feeling. It's an action. Thus, it's something I do. And I think I might project whether I feel it or not. <laughs> he didn't say, for example, if you feel joy, rejoice. Or if it's easy, to rejoice, rejoice. Or if you see everything working in your favor, rejoice. He didn't, he didn't qualify it like he did qualify it, but not like that. He just says rejoice. Now, the object of the action, the target, where's the, where's the action going? Well, the verse says rejoice in whom? The Lord. I think that's important. It's, it's as important about what he didn't say as what he did say. The target of your rejoicing is not your circumstances, is not your needs are being met, is not you got your way, it's not the situation you're in, it's not you feel good, you rejoice in the Lord. Now, I think there's a whole bunch of stuff in that. And you could filter that in and perhaps we'll touch with some of that as we go along in the lord i think in at least broadly speaking that's in who he is who he is to you and what he has done on your behalf i think those three things are clearly in view who he is who he is to you and what he has done for you rejoice in him now, this is a man sitting in prison writing this. Not because of crimes he's done, but because of Jesus in his life and his faithfulness to Christ. I think Paul, sitting there writing this, thought, they're going to need a little punch because uh, we're, we will make excuses. Well, Paul, you, you don't understand. It's not like you've ever been in prison. Oh, no, you are in prison. Uh, it's not like you've ever been opposed by the enemy. Oh, no, you have been opposed. by. We all want to make excuses like, yeah, but. And so Paul put a reiteration, a repetition for what? For emphasis. Rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> and again, I say rejoice. I see that face. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> what are you, You're looking at each other, aren't you? You're looking with, at me like with incredulity. You got to be kidding. I don't believe that. No, no. You got to take this seriously. Because God takes your joy in Him seriously. That's, that's my handling of the text. Now, I want to pose four questions. What does this mean? How is it comprehensive? What are the obstacles? And why is it important? I'm going to repeat the questions as we go. Okay. Number one, what does it mean? What does it mean to rejoice in the Lord always? Let me see if I can try to answer that question. I think it means, at the very least, that we should find our joy in the Lord over joy in other people and other things. Now, as long as the bank account's full, or the investments are going well, or the kids are well, or uh, things are going great at work, or I have a great teacher at school... If your teacher is your mom, of course you have a great teacher at school. <clears throat> but you don't take joy in those things. You don't take joy in your circumstances. It's easy. Did you know even pagans can do that? <laughs> if everything goes great for an unsafe person, they're having a good day. That's nothing unusual. This means you take 
joy in the Lord instead of taking joy in others and other things. This means that we rejoice in the Lord's redemptive work and promise to us. I do think that it does have some, some meaning and interpretation as to the person of God, but I think it, it, it even more specifically has to do with the Lord's redemptive work for me. What has he done for me? What is his promise to me? We are brought back to the promises of God over and over and over. And I think that's what Jesus meant when he said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. And he's been talking about anxieties. And he pointed us to birds of the air. They are fed by God the Father and the Flowers of the field are clothed in beautiful colors. And if God feeds birds and clothes flowers, he'll take care of you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Point your heart in that direction. I think that's what Paul meant in Colossians 3. When he said, set your heart, set your minds, and set your affections on things above. Not on things on the earth. It is not that we don't live here. It is not that our feet are not grounded on the dusty paths of earth, but our minds and hearts are in heaven. I think that's why Paul said in Philippians 1, I, I, I long, I desire, I want to depart and be with Christ, but I'm willing to stay here if God wants me here for a while longer to serve him. See, there's a willingness to stay here. There's a contentment in that, but there's a hunger to go home. I think that's what that means. I think it means to be serious about our joy. I went to um, the pastor's conference in Minneapolis back in late January that John Piper and Desiring God and Bethlehem College and Seminary uh, jointly put on this conference. And, uh, and I have no idea why anybody in their right mind would have a conference in Minnesota in late January. Somebody needs to rethink the decision-making paradigm here. Uh, but they call the conference, and I thought it was very striking, serious joy. Serious joy. Joy doesn't sound serious, but it is. It's very, very serious. We'll get that in the fourth question. It means to be serious about the business of joy in the Christian life. I think it means that the, found, the very foundation upon which we live, no matter what we face, no matter where we live, no matter what point of time we live, no matter where we grew up, no matter what our prospects are, that the very foundation of our life is God himself and all that we have in Christ. I think all of that is in view to describe the meaning of our joy. Second question. How are we to understand the comprehensiveness? How are we to understand the comprehensiveness of this command? And by the way, I, I don't have to play with the text to say this command is comprehensive. Why? Because it says so. Where does it say that in Philippians 4.4? 4? The word always. You see that word always? That's comprehensive. In every circumstance, in every situation, all the time with everybody. <laughs> and my tendency is to say, God, are you kidding? Is, is there really, did God really mean this to be comprehensive? That no matter what period of time in which I live, I, 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 I must confess that the older I get, the more nostalgic I become. And I don't know that it's just because I'm nostalgic or that I'm at the age that I, I'm in. But I look back on my childhood, where I grew up, and when I grew up as a wonderful time in America. And I can't help it. I compare today with where I grew up. And I don't even know that we locked our doors at our, I mean, we knew everybody. If somebody broke in, we'd find them and 
took care of the problem right there. I mean, you know, we didn't have any policemen. It was just a different time when I would go over to a neighbor's house. This is confession of sin and steal apples off their tree. Another neighbor saw me and rebuked me. Now, you don't believe your pastor would do such a thing, do you? She said, now, Johnny, call me Johnny. I'm going to tell your mother, oh, that was the worst thing he could have done. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just a different day. I, I'm comparing time. But at my age, I'm also comparing seasons of life. I'm heading into a season of life where I, I watch, uh, I've seen others go through a season of what they call the golden years. Are some of you in the golden years? What's golden about it, somebody said. You ought to see my doctor's appointments. You ought to see, you know, this or that. This is, it doesn't look like a season for joy. Perhaps we're going through a time of difficulty. Things have just turned against you. You can't get a job. The car doesn't seem to work right. <laughs> things, you know, you, everything, the house has hit a point where things just break all the time. Right? The comprehensiveness of this command is it doesn't matter what. You rejoice in the Lord. Does that pinch a little bit? Third question. What are the obstacles that stand in the way of our obeying this command? What are the obstacles? Well, I'm going to indicate three. One is misplaced priorities. I think one of the problems that keeps us from rejoicing in the Lord always is because we elevate things too high in our lives. Uh, we, we are too attached to our stuff. And when something happens to our stuff, we lose our joy because our joy was in our stuff. And there's a sense in which we do in the Christian life try a challenge to live with an open hand that God can take anything and everything out of our hand if he so chooses and we pray as christians not my will but your will be done with the absolute confidence that god only chooses what's best for us right misplaced priorities selfishness is an obstacle selfishness and i find myself returning to this problem as i think about preaching a lot I, I think the, the greatest problem in America today is selfishness. I think the greatest problem in our churches today is selfishness. I think the greatest problem in this church is selfishness. Self-centered, self-absorbed. It's all about me. I want to talk about me. I want to think about me. I want you to think about me. And we elevate ourselves to a place of idolatry. We don't even know it. We are so, we're just so saturated in, a, in the lens of life that only sees self. Everything is measured by how it relates to me. That will rob you of your joy. Because there is nothing that is selfish that is ever happy. Do you know that? The only way to be happy is to lose yourself. You know why? Because you cannot love and be selfish at the same time. And the only way to be happy is to love. Selfishness is an obstacle. Third is stubbornness. Stubbornness. We just won't give in. We're going to have our way. We're, we're kind of like bullies. We want our way. We want everybody in our lives to serve us. Including God. Now, God, you do what I tell you to do. That's not prayer. <laughs> and oh, by the way, you're not God. He is. Can you imagine an ant looking up at me and said, now, John, I'm going to tell you what to do. And I just squash it and say, forget it. 
Why, why doesn't he squash us and say forget? Because he loves us, that's why. Obstacles. Fourth com, uh, question. Why is this so important? Why does God care whether we have joy, why, whether we're rejoicing in him or not? Are you kidding? Everything comes into view. Because if we have a lack of joy in the Lord, this means we have a lack of love for the Lord. Joy and the Lord and love go together. Who, who you love, you enjoy. You enjoy who you love and you love them. If we love the Lord, we enjoy them. The psalmist said, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires. Delight yourself in the Lord. Going to the Lord's day is a wonderful thing. Reading the word is a wonderful thing. Prayer is a wonderful thing. Spending time with God is a wonderful thing. You cannot love God unless you enjoy him and have joy in him. And you cannot be right with God unless you love God. That's why it's important. It's, imp it's important because you cannot have joy in the Lord unless you have faith. You cannot have faith if you don't have joy. Faith enables us to rest in the Lord, trust in the Lord, hope in the Lord. Lord, you could say, I don't, you talk about joy. I don't have it figured out. I don't know what you're going to do. And it seems like it's, it's going to be, it's going to get worse. But Lord, I know you're in charge. I'm going to trust you with all my heart and I'm going to let it go. And then you start enjoying his promises to you. It's important. A lack of joy in the Lord means a lack of surrender to God's will. This is important stuff. If you're not if you're not enjoying God, if you're not having joy in His redemptive work and, and promise, is it possible that there's within my heart and yours a resistance to Him? As if to say, I want my will or I'm going to be a fuss budget. What's a fuss budget? I, don't, I guess they budget fusses all the time. Or what was it? Grumpy square pants or whatever his name was. Or grumpy square pants. Oh, that was Bob. Was it Bob? Sponge Bob. Grumpy pants. I don't know where I am and how to get home. But anyway. Why is it so important? Because it's vital that we are surrendered. Yielded. That we kneel before our Lord and say, I give all my expectations to you. I'm going to close with a, a portion of a story that you know well in the book of Acts chapter 16. It's interesting, this story also involves Paul and it also involves prison. I'm just going to read this passage and, and just see if it strikes you. Uh, Paul had seen some converts in Philippi and the Lord had worked in the heart and life of a demonized girl who had what the scripture called a spirit of divination and the, her owners, she was a slave, uh, made fortune off, off of her, a fortune telling. And they got Paul in trouble and put Paul and his friend Silas into prison. Verse 19, chapter 16 of the book of Acts, when her owner saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. When they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice which they were not interested in either but that's neither here nor there verse 22 the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off of them stripped them and gave orders to beat them with rods 
and when they had inflicted many blows upon them. I wonder how many blows it was. Many blows upon them. They threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison. I would assume that the deepest, the darkest portion of the prison. And fashioned their feet in the stocks. Now I want you to note verse 25. About midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. You know the story, don't you? The earthquake comes. God sends an earthquake. It breaks the chains of their bonds. It, it throws the door off its hinges. Instead of the prisoners fleeing, the prisoners stayed put listening to Paul and Silas lead and praise. At the same time, singing hymns. Jailer comes in, assuming they've all escaped, finding they haven't. Comes under terrible conviction and falls before Paul and says, What must I do to be saved? Let me say this to you, brothers and sisters. It could be that God is so working in this day where we live. So that we can demonstrate joy in God in the worst of circumstances. That this world might come to see that he is worthy of that. Think on this. May the Lord speak to our hearts as we ponder it in a personal way. Let us pray. Lord, I do not pray for troubles. I do not pray for problems. I do not pray for attacks upon your people. Enough of that stuff will come as it is. I do pray and trust in you to measure out what we need to go through. Your wisdom is controlled by your love for us. Your wisdom and your providential response to our lives. These things are controlled by your sovereign plan for our lives. You want us to grow in our faith and you want us to be true proclaimers of your glory and the gospel of Jesus in our lives. I pray that you will strengthen us to that task. For what may be ahead. And I pray that you begin by taking our eyes off ourself. And eyes off the world. And eyes off our stuff. And casting our thoughts. Our dreams. Our love. Our longing. And our joy. To you in heaven. Use us we pray. In whatever way you see fit. In Jesus' name we ask it.